so today we have let's see igor are you there somewhere i know you i let you in i'm here okay <laughs> we have and i'm not trigo is that how you pronounce your last name trigo trigo uh and igor is uh the strategic partnership director and senior policy advisor at the california solar and storage energy association uh, prior to this, he spent 12 years with the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, serving in roles spanning from nuclear safety, nonproliferation, energy, and governmental affairs. He was uh, on the Berkeley Rent Control Board. He's been uh, on Sierra Club California's uh, Executive Committee and co-chair of the San Francisco Bay Energy and Climate Committee and SF Bay Chapter's immediate past chair. Uh, he has a master's in engineering from Duke, certificate in international security from Stanford, certificate in public leadership from the University of San Francisco. He's a mechanical engineer and got a BA in political science from Berkeley. Uh, right now, through the Harvard Kennedy School Certificate Program, he's working on an organization, organizing project to bring distributed solar and storage and energy democracy to his homeland of Ukraine. And I want to add, too, he's also chair of the California Democratic Party Environmental Caucus. So he's going to bring us up to date with what's happening and uh, why you might want to think about going solar right now. Excellent. And I know we're a little bit over time, so I, I will just hop right in. Um, great to be here, of course. Um, next slide, please. Okay. And this is our, so the California Solar and Storage Association, my employer, is the state's largest renewable energy trade association. We represent, uh, at this point, over 750 members. Um, and I will tell you that while we have some major um, major um, companies uh, as our members, as well as a number of nonprofits like Grid Alternatives doing good work, 60% of our members are small contractors doing solar and battery installs. The average size of them is about 10 employees. Many are local. Um, Many are women-owned, veteran-owned, uh, and or BIPOC-owned. Um, the Solar Rights Alliance, which is uh, the subject of this presentation, um, that is, um, an, I, I will talk more about it, but this is, uh, if you are not in the solar industry, but just support the idea of folks being able to control their energy bills, um, you should join the Solar Rights Alliance. Uh, this is a million uh, members strong, uh, or 100,000 users plus folks that one day would like to be able to get solar. We'll talk about that. It's an all volunteer board of directors, um, two full time equivalent staff, um, largely volunteer driven. Next slide, please. So this is from a webinar that uh, the Solar Rights Alliance recently did. Um, it applies to rooftop and ground mount solar, <gasps> owned lease or um, what are called power purchase agreement solar systems, which um, I, I can get into more, uh, residential, commercial and industrial solar um, and keep going. Okay, so what is net energy metering three? Um, <laughs> uh, next uh, slide. So net energy metering is a good thing. This is how we have gotten to over 1.5 million uh, rooftop panels uh, in the state of California. That's equivalent to getting um, every single day um, tens of thousands of cars off the road or shutting down permanently a number of natural gas power plants. Um, these rules um, were set by the CPUC or California Public Utilities Commission. They've made or revised the rules three times since the legislature established net metering in the 90s. Um, next slide, please. 
um, th this is the demarcation between NEM1 and NEM2. Most of the folks uh, we're talking about now are on NEM2. They went solar since 2017. Incidentally, um, <laughs> according to the Lawrence Barkley National Lab, as well as the CPUC's own um, data, which I mined um, prior well, over the past year, um, consistently almost 50% of the rooftop solar that has been adopted uh, has been in working class and middle class communities. Uh, NEM3 is the one that is going to apply after April 14th, 2023. So we're going to talk about what this means. Who is this going to affect? Everyone in an investor-owned utility, including uh, folks in community choice aggregators. Um, so I'm in the East Bay Community Energy uh, Joint Power Authority jurisdiction. Um, many of you are um, under Marin Clean Energy, but it still uses PG&E wires. Therefore, it's going to apply to you. Uh, it does not apply to munis. Um, I don't know if there are too many munis in the Bay Area, so we can um, go on to the next slide. Okay, so the way this works now is when you, when your solar panel um, produces more energy than you consume, it flows back to the grid. You want to share it with your neighbor. You want to get compensated for it, right? It's only fair. Um, and so you get a bill credit for that energy that is roughly equal to whatever you sell to your neighbor. Um, and it offsets the electricity that you buy from PG&E when the sun is not shining. You can stay on this program for 20 years from the date the system was turned on. Next slide, please. And yeah, um, so this is what's gonna happen after uh, April 14th, um, you will get 75 to 80% less for your extra solar energy than current solar users. That's about 30 cents in kilowatt hour. Now to translate this down to um, kind of the average person, uh, on average, um, it takes between five and nine years right now for a solar panel system to pay for itself. It's called the payback period. This is going to increase it to 12 to 15 years. Um, and then you're also forced onto a rate plan with high evening electricity rates. We're gonna talk about who's behind this. Um, it's, uh, it's dastardly, but let's go to the next slide. Okay. Now, um, the Public Utilities Commission in doing these rules um, claims that um, it's okay because everyone who's going to get solar will have access to a battery rebate. Um, uh, to be honest, um, <laughs> uh, we're not even close to there yet. Uh, IOA funding will certainly help, but um, we're not there yet. Like there, there are just not enough batteries around to even do this. Um, but it is true that uh, there are going to be incentives under the new structure uh, to get a battery. But if you get a solar and battery now, uh, it will be more worthwhile than getting a battery later. Um, you know, yeah, highly restricted funds, not available to a majority of people, um, basic nonsense. Um, okay. That's the bad news. We'll talk about some of the ways we can still fight back. Um, here's what we were able to um, ensure that this provision does not do. Thanks to you were a critical part of this coalition, 600 plus organizations strong, half of California's congressional delegation, um, affordable housing providers, um, many, many everyday people went to the legislature, went to the governor, went to the CPUC over two years and said, no solar tax. Uh, PG&E originally proposed $57 a month of a solar tax on anyone that owns solar, including working class and middle-class folk. Complete BS, right? Um, 
and we were able to collectively stop that. Um, and on top of that, um, for those folks who um, apply for a solar system before April 14th of this year, will be locked in for uh, 20 years from the start of their interconnection agreement. So it does not apply to existing solar users. Um, however, if you add more panels, and this has to be, if you add more than 10% more panels or one kilowatt hour greater output, whatever is higher, you will be kicked off on to NAM3. Uh, anything below that, you will stay on NAM2. Uh, we'll talk later about what happens if you add a battery. If you add a battery, you will stay on NAM2 as well if you are under NAM2 as of April 14th. Uh, Lock-in period stays uh, for 20 years. The California Public Utilities Commission in its initial decision wanted to muck with this too. Uh, there was a mass protest or series of protests on the streets, Sacramento, uh, in front of the CPUC itself, and they relented and went back to saying, uh, we promised 20 years, we're going to keep 20 years as the lock-in. Um, okay. So, um, this is the exception I talked about um, around adding more panels after April 14th. Um, here's what needs to be done by April 14th. Uh, the following must be submitted to the utility. It has to be a complete application. Now, the application itself does not have to be approved by April 14th by PG&E. And PG&E has been record reporting they're backlogged by a month and their staff isn't even trained well, like everyone is well-meaning at pg and &E, but often giving erroneous information. I will provide uh, this presentation has the best link of FAQs to go to, but um, you need um, a signed contract. Um, yeah, happy to get you a copy of the, this, um, a yeah, single line so diagram. So Igor, just yep. to be clear, this is if you want to stay under the old rate structure, you need to do this by the 14th. Correct. Um, what you don't need to do, based, like right now, if you have always thought about getting solar um, and haven't acted on it, um, we have a number of local installers that are very, very busy getting uh, applications from everyone right now trying to beat the clock. But some of you will, them can accommodate folks. Um, we at CALSA, we do have a list of local contractors doing this work who are members of ours. Happy to, if um, I'll share my email. If you want that list, I can get it to you. Um, work with a contractor and get them to um, uh, apply on your behalf by April 14th. Next slide, please. Um, if you, if your lock-in period is about to expire, you have to take down your existing system and replace it with a new one. And by April 14th, su uh, submit the same thing. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a question we're getting quite a bit. Um, existing solar users and any solar user that gets into the um, their NAM application portal by April 14th can add a battery without impacting their lock-in period. So that's additional good news. Uh, next slide. If you sell your home, the new owner will take over the remainder of the lock-in period same thing if you um, are in a multifamily home that is a rental or a single family home that's rented. Um, it's the lock in period stays with the property, not the um, person on the lease. Um,
Now, um, if you don't have solar, um, again, this is what you need to do by April 14th. Um, so all of these things. Um, and again, to be clear, construction does not need to be complete by April 14th. Interconnection doesn't need to be complete by April 14th. Uh, you actually have three years uh, from the time you submit to get your building permit. Um, now you're over in Benicia, and I'm excited to tell you that Benicia is one of the um, first jurisdictions to adopt instantaneous permitting for solar and they're working on battery storage. It's a tool called Solar App. Um, there's actually a state law that we passed that will require every jurisdiction over 50,000 or population or more to do this by September. But basically, um, at least the city of Benicia um, wants you to go solar. They don't want this, uh, these delays to be an impediment. So you will have no quarrel from uh, the city. Um, for other jurisdictions, talk to me. We do have a campaign to get every jurisdiction, including the unincorporated um, Solano County to adopt solar app uh, for instantaneous permitting. Um, there is a solar rights consumer guide. Yep, there's the link, Roger, uh, just put it out. Thank you so much. Most importantly, get three bids. Um, many uh, companies are, local companies are members of ours, but there are lots of companies out there get at least three bids. Um, do not make a decision if you feel pressured. Um, don't let, it's your decision. Don't let anyone pressure you into one. In fact, if they are, um, you know, uh, we, we have reputable companies that are members of ours. There are unfortunately some bad actors. So don't, um, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, the Solar Rights Alliance is uh, one of the best sources of information to get to go to. So why did the state do this? You know, we're supposed to be the bastion of progressivism. Um, well, it's a financial reason. Um, solar users, are, well, the claim from utilities and those they fund is that solar users don't pay their fair share. Um, I already told you that these rules are gonna hurt working class and middle class folks the most who make up almost uh, half of the solar adopters in the state for the last few years. Um, so the real reason is PG&E <laughs> is claiming that somehow we are the problem when uh, we have paid PG&E $12 billion last year alone, 60% um, of it for uh, fire mitigation. So basically, we're paying them to clean up messes of their own making. Again, I want to make a distinction. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about the hardworking men and women who work at PG&E. Um, I am, however, talking about uh, PG&E as an entity as a whole and the utility industry as a whole, which spent $56 million on campaign contributions and lobbying since 2017. Um, you can... I think skip the next three slides. Um, stopping the solar tax was a big deal and your voices made it possible. Uh, uh, next slide. And our vision remains the same. We continue to believe that everyone has the right to make solar energy without utility or government obstacles. Um, millions of people have a availed themselves of solar and batteries. We want every Californian to have that same opportunity. Next slide, please. So uh, there is a continued path from here. We continue to, uh, and if you go to Solar Rights Alliance and join, you will start getting weekly emails about opportunities to do this. Um, there was one two weeks ago at the legislature. There was a committee hearing. Uh, again, utility-backed folks were trying to make the false claim that solar is the problem. They got shut down pretty quickly by 50 public commenters saying, 
nope, the facts show the data to like, that this is not borne out by the data at all. Um, there is an effort uh, to be clear, CALSA is not involved in it, but several um, organizations, including the Center for Biological Diversity and Environmental Justice Group has filed a lawsuit uh, or, well, right now they filed an appeal the CPUC will probably sit there for 60 days and tell them to pound sand, at which time there will be a lawsuit uh, to asking that them three be reversed. There's the information about the appeal. Next slide, please. And batteries. We, <laughs> uh, you know what the largest battery is in the state? It's actually not Moss Landing. It's the battery in your garage. That's right. Despite PG&E's best efforts, we're continuing to work on microgrids um, to make it possible for all of you to be able to get batteries that you can afford, uh, to be able to afford batteries, get them, interconnect them together, and be able to power entire communities um, without having to rely on an unreliable grid and actually making the grid more resilient in the process. So. Uh, sign up because the next thing coming up is on June 6th. It's a solar lobby day. Um, please do sign up. Um, we'd love to have you there. Um, next slide. Um, I talked about solar app already. Um, no brainer. We should be streamlining permitting. Please get engaged in that campaign. Uh, you can email info at solarrights.org. I will share my email uh, in the chat as well. Um, and if you have any questions, happy to answer them. If you have uh, questions about who our local member contractors are, um, I, can't, I can't choose my favorites. We have 750 of them. They're all my favorites, but there's a number of local contractors that I think you will really like and I'm happy to share that information with you as well. Um, happy to answer any questions and thank you so much for your time. Uh, Igor, I have a question and that is if, if I wanted to um, add solar panels and avoid the NEM3, do I, do I have to then also have a contract just to put an extra couple solar panels on my roof. I actually had to pay a little money this year at TrueUp. So I'm thinking about adding some. Yeah, so it's it's going to be a uh, case dependent. Um, and I, I encourage you to do a payback analysis for the net, uh, well, do a break even analysis um, because um, if you wanted a brand new interconnection contract, um, you do have to show physical evidence uh, eventually to PG&E of dismantling your whole system to put in a new system. That uh, I don't want to put in a new. I'm just thinking about if I could possibly add like a couple of panels. Yeah, uh, you can add right now. You can actually add uh, before April 14th um, as many panels as you want. After April 14th, um, it will be limited to uh, where 10% increase or one kW hour increase in output. Um, you do need to um, you need to get move on that now. Of course, uh, the the thing is, um, wh what year did you get solar, Kathy? Oh, I think about, I think we've had it five or six years. Yeah. So your interconnection period will stay the same. Uh, it'll be, or your lock-in period will be 20 years minus the five or six years you've had it. So if you want a full clean bi bill of health, 20 years to start right now, that's where... Um, you know, some folks are choosing to take down their system. Usually that's when their system is approaching a, their 20 year period anyway. But in your case, I think um, for these next 14 years, I would say in the next like month, if you want to add panels, uh, 
you should move on that right now. Okay.